sit right here? Why don't you sit right there? I'll sit right okay. there. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Stan Hedemont. I'm the executive director of New York County Defender Services. We are one of the public defender offices in New York City. Uh, NYCDS uh, operates exclusively in the borough of Manhattan, where every year our office represents 10 to 12,000 New Yorkers accused of crimes in our criminal courts. Um, I'm also thrilled on behalf of the NOADA board, that's the National Legal Aid and Defender Association, to welcome all of you to this Gideon at 60 celebration. Since 1911, NOADA has been bringing together membership organizations from the civil legal services community, the defender community, our client council, and our partners on our corporate advisory board to ensure that all persons, all persons, regardless of the size of your bank account, have access to our courts and access to justice. Today we are joined by two other national organizations that are dedicated to improving the quality of indigent defense in the United States. And so I'd like to introduce Lisa Wayne, the Executive Director of the National Association of Criminal Defense Attorneys. Thank you and welcome. Um, what a glorious day to acknowledge a glorious moment in our history, and that is the decision of Gideon versus Wainwright. My name is Lisa Wayne. I'm the executive director for the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. I have been a defense lawyer for 37 years, and I had the privilege and the honor of serving clients as a public defender in Colorado, one of the best resource public defender systems in the country. Today is a day that we recognize that the Sixth Amendment um, came to fruition because of a man named Mr. Gideon. Mr. Gideon, and it was the summer of 1961, Mr. Gideon was charged with a crime. He was white, he was poor, and he was without means. He was down on his luck and he was, and he was struggling with the disease of addiction, something that we see frequently today. He was living in the streets of Panama City, and he was arrested for a burglary. The evidence against him was an eyewitness. He told the court he could not afford a lawyer, and he asked for a lawyer to be appointed. The court denied it. The court told him the only people that get appointed counsel are those who are facing the death penalty. In other words, he was denied his Sixth Amendment right to counsel. But Mr. Gideon, had the wherewithal to write a letter to the Supreme Court of the United States. He took a pen and a pencil and he wrote a letter and that became the petition um, that he wrote to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court heard the case and it was a unanimous decision that was written um, by the majority that was Justice Black. What Justice Black said, and I quote, was, fairness to all cannot be realized if a poor man has to face his accuser without a lawyer to assist him. Public defense became the indispensable protectors of our community and those marginalized and those poor who did not have a voice. Public defense strengthens the integrity of the system, but it requires resources. It requires a commitment to do more than just say we are going to help you, but actually give us those resources. The 60th anniversary of Gideon stands beside 50 years of mass incarceration in this country from the time that the war on drugs started. As a, as a, as a country, we have come far, but we have so far to come. Today we stand here with a commitment to the Sixth Amendment and to access to justice and the right to have counsel, but we must make a commitment to do more than talk the talk. Today is our acknowledgement and our commitment for true legal reform that ultimately and hopefully translates to justice for all. Thank you.
Next up, we are going to hear from the National Association of Public Defense and Keita Haynes, who is the criminal defense attorney and serves on the board of directors. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me here. Um, as Lisa said, this is a very important moment. Um, my name is Keita Haynes, and I do sit on the board of the National Association for Public Defense. I am also a former public defender from Nashville, Tennessee, and I am also directly impacted. And being someone that is directly impacted, I often ask the question, what does equal justice under the law mean? It is one of the pillars of our democracy, and it is here inscribed upon the Supreme Court building right here in DC. But as I said, what does it really mean? And is it actual equal for everyone? For so many of us that are caught up in the criminal legal system, equal justice under the law has been and continues to be an unfulfilled promise. Our current system of mass incarceration at its very core is deeply unjust and inhumane. It has relegated an astonishing number of people, overwhelmingly black, brown, and poor, to a subclass of citizens deemed less deserving of dignity, respect, and equal protection under the law. This system is beyond flawed, and it, was made a mock and it has made a mockery of America's founding principles of democracy, opportunity, and basic human rights. From the never-ending cycle of poverty and crime to the unjust of mandatory minimum sentences and America's fictitious war on drugs, from the damning power of prosecutorial discretion, tragic police citizen encounters, and to the difficulty experienced by formerly incarcerated individuals transitioning back into their communities, the evidence pointing to the country's failure is overwhelming. But even in the face of so many challenges and failures in our criminal legal system, the public defenders continue to show up and they continue to fight. Yes, these fights are tough and yes, they are, they are lonely nights and a lot of times we as public defenders are standing alone like the man in the arena with our faces marred with dust, sweat and blood, committed to the ideals and principles of fairness, humanity and equality for everyone, principles and ideals that have so long eluded the criminal legal system. But the bold, courageous, and determination of the work that public defenders do is a very key component to making equal justice under the law no longer just a concept, but a promise that hopefully one day we all can believe in. Thank you. So on March 18th, 1963, a unanimous Supreme Court held that poor persons accused of crimes have a fundamental right to an attorney. That unanimous Supreme Court stated that if you can't afford an attorney, it is incumbent upon the government to provide that counsel. And as we sit here six decades later, I wonder what those justices would think of the state of public defense if they were here 60 years later. We've certainly made a lot of strides and improvements over the last six decades. But I submit to you that I think the justices would be disappointed. I think they would be disappointed because decade after decade, year after year, public defense continues to be underfunded in the United States. Gideon gave rise to the public defense system we now have in the United States. And so whether you're part of a state public defense system like Wisconsin or New Jersey or Colorado, or you're part of a county-based system like New York and California, and Louisiana, we are all underfunded. If you Google public defense today, you will come across articles from 1990, 2000, from yesterday. And the theme will be the same. Understaffed, crushing caseloads, underpaid and undervalued. And this is a conscious decision that our legislatures make throughout this country because a budget is a value statement. When the state, when the county, when the city, when they vote on those budgets and they decide how we are going to spend our money, it is a value statement of what they think is important and what they value. And the chronic underfunding of public defense sends a message to those aligned public defenders, we don't value you. It sends a message to those that they stand next to in courtrooms, we don't value you. We don't value your families. We don't value the communities that you come from. 
But today, on the 60th anniversary of Gideon, we are here to send a different message. And I submit to you all that having the chief law enforcement officer of the United States here today to celebrate Gideon, to celebrate the power of public defense, sends a loud and clear message to legislative bodies throughout the country, public defenders matter. So to you public defenders on the line, who every day stand shoulder to shoulder with your clients in courtrooms throughout this vast country, you matter. Your budgets need to matter. Because at the end of the day, public defenders, the name, it's more than representing the individual we stand next to. You defend the public. Why is that the term? Because we know that public defenders defend the Constitution of the United States every single day. It is public defenders who ensure someone's right to a speedy trial, to a public trial. It is public defenders who are bringing cases to the court to ensure that our citizens are not subject to unreasonable search and seizures. And it is public defenders who ensure that those who are incarcerated are not subjected to cruel and unusual punishment. That is the power of public defense. We matter and our budgets matter. At this time, please join me in welcoming the Attorney General of the United States of America, Merrick Garland. Good afternoon. We are here today because this weekend marks 60 years since Gideon versus Wainwright held, quote, any person hauled into court who is too poor to hire a lawyer cannot be assured a fair trial unless counsel is provided to him. Just to describe the experience of Clarence Earl Gideon before his case reached the Supreme Court is to recall how different the American justice system was before that decision. Gideon was charged with breaking and entering a pool hall. Without funds and with only an eighth grade education, he asked the trial judge to appoint counsel for him. When his request was denied, Gideon endeavored to defend himself. As Justice Black's opinion for the court recounted, quote, Gideon conducted his defense about as well as anyone could be expected for a layperson. He made an opening statement to the jury, cross-examined the state's witnesses, and made a short closing argument. The jury soon returned a guilty verdict, and Gideon was sentenced to five years in state prison. After the Supreme Court reversed the judgment, however, the case was retried. This time, represented by a local counsel, Gideon was acquitted. At every stage of my career, as a criminal defense attorney, prosecutor, judge, and now our chief law enforcement officer, I have seen the truth of what Justice Black wrote in Gideon. Quote, lawyers in criminal courts are necessities, not luxuries. Without capable criminal defense attorneys, defendants cannot understand the scope of their rights at each stage of the criminal process. Prosecutors cannot learn of errors in their factual assumptions or legal analyses that could point them in the direction of different resolutions. Jurors cannot hear the full stories needed to fairly adjudicate cases, and judges cannot hear the full legal arguments needed to guide their decisions. Criminal defense attorneys put the government's case to the test. In so doing, they make sure that every part of our system is fairer, more equal, and more just. But the Gideon case did more than just help ensure justice in individual cases. With its decision in Gideon, the Supreme Court transformed the American legal system by renewing the foundational promise of equal justice under law. It reaffirmed that the law protects all of us, the poor as well as the rich, the powerless as well as the powerful. In so doing, it reaffirmed the nation's commitment to the rule of law, and trust in the rule of law is what 
keeps America's democracy together. That trust requires not only that justice be done, but that it be seen to be done. And only the presence of counsel zealously defending their clients' rights can ensure public confidence in, legis in the legitimacy of judicial proceedings, regardless of their outcome. There is still so much more work to be done to make the promise of Gideon real. That work demands enormous effort from the legal community. Most of all, it makes enormous demands on those lawyers, like many in this room, who serve as public defenders, criminal justice act attorneys, pro bono lawyers, and appointed counsels of every kind. Our justice system today would be no different than it was before Gideon if tens of thousands of lawyers had not stood up and continued to stand up to take on the calling of public defense. Your work is essential not only to your clients, but to the functioning of our judicial system. I know that our justice system does not treat you accordingly. However much we at the Justice Department complain, and rightly so, about our limited resources, I know full well that yours are far more limited. I know that public defense remains drastically underfunded. I know that public defender offices are, experience seri are experiencing serious recruitment and retention problems that only worsened during the COVID-19 pandemic. I know that you often carry staggering caseloads and that your staff and investigative resources are insufficient to say nothing of your financial compensation. I also know that the pressure on criminal defense attorneys is enormous. There are no small cases when someone's liberty is on the line. The Justice Department recognizes the urgency and seriousness of these challenges. We are committed to doing all that we can to support our colleagues who have devoted their careers to public defense. One year after Gideon, Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy announced the creation of an Office of Criminal Justice within the Justice Department, focused on the provision of counsel to the poor. In doing so, he said, quote, it must be our purpose in government to ensure that the department over which I preside is more than a department of prosecution and is in fact a department of justice. It is with that same conviction that I announced the restoration of a standalone Office for Access to Justice within the department in 2021. And it is why I asked Rachel Rossi, a former public defender, to lead it. Our Office for Access to Justice is working closely with those of you on the front lines to identify and address the most urgent criminal and civil legal needs of communities across America. Over the past few weeks, department officials have crisscrossed the country to hear from public defense leaders on the ground. Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco launched the department's nationwide tour in Miami, where she met with leaders of the federal and state public defenders offices and defense advocates. She also announced a 100-day comprehensive review to ensure consistent, timely access to counsel in Bureau of Prisons pretrial facilities. Staff of the Office of Access to Justice went to Tulsa to meet with representatives of an organization dedicated to serving mothers in the justice system with a holistic defense model, which not only represents their clients' interests in court, but also addresses the underlying challenges in their lives outside of the criminal justice system. Department attorneys and staff traveled to the Muscogee Creek Nation to meet with tribal leaders and defenders to discuss public defense challenges specific to tribal communities. Director Rossi and Amy Solomon, the department's principal deputy assistant attorney general for the Office of Justice Programs, traveled to Nashville. There, they highlighted a public defense program that is receiving burn jag funding from its state administering agency. They made clear that states can use burn jag funding from the Justice Department to support public defense services. Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division, Kenneth Polite, joined Director Rossi in Los Angeles to discuss the department's efforts to encourage law students to consider public defense as a profession. And this week, Associate Attorney General Vanita Gupta 
traveled to Des Moines, where she announced that the department will be establishing a new position within the Office for Access to Justice dedicated to supporting state and local public defense. We know this is only a start. We know that much more is required. Like the attorneys general who came before me, I begin every day by walking through a rotunda just outside my office where these words are inscribed, quote, the United States wins its point whenever justice is done its citizens in the courts. The message, of course, is that this is true regardless of whether the outcome favors the government. This is what distinguishes our justice system from those of many other countries. And this is what distinguishes our Justice Department from the law enforcement agencies of many other countries. We are responsible not only for enforcing the law, but for upholding the rule of law. We are responsible for protecting civil rights and pursuing justice for all Americans. And justice demands more than good prosecutors and good judges. It demands meaningful access to counsel for the accused, including those who cannot afford to hire attorneys. To provide that access and to reaffirm the kind of faith in law upon which our democracy depends, public defender offices need more resources. Our nation needs more lawyers to answer the call of public service by providing criminal defense for those who cannot afford it. And as a legal community, we need to recognize and reaffirm the necessity and the nobility of the public defense profession. When I was a law student, one of my mentors was John Hart Ely. Although he was recognized as one of the foremost legal scholars in the country, Ely emphasized that the thing he was most proud of was the work he did on the Gideon Brief as a summer associate at Arnold Fortas and Porter in 1962. No doubt that influenced my own subsequent decision to join that same law firm. The firm's then senior partner when I joined was Abe Crash, who had supervised Ely and worked with Abe Fortas on the Gideon argument. Crash never failed to emphasize that er to every new lawyer that Clarence Earl Gideon was the most important client the firm had ever represented. Ely, Ely and Crash knew that the integrity of the American justice system depends on effective representation for indigent defendants. They knew that there are few things more meaningful and honorable than applying one's talent, experience, and education to representing another person before the state, no matter what that person is accused of having done. They knew that the impact of Gideon would be felt for generations, and they knew that fulfilling the promise of Gideon would require each generation of our country's lawyers to take up its important cause. The Justice Department is proud to stand with the public defenders and criminal defense attorneys in this room and across the country who are doing just that. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you to the Attorney General for those heartfelt remarks. At this time, I'm going to call up Vice President for Civil Legal Services and Strategic Policy Initiatives at NOADA, Radhika Singh. Thank you, Stan, um, and thank you everyone for being here. Uh, thanks to the Attorney General, I know that, that he had to run, but uh, really to second Stan's point, what an amazing thing it is to have, to have the, the lead law enforcement arm, the lead prosecutor of this country come here today and, and acknowledge how important public defenders are in what we do every day. 
Before we delve deeper into our program, um, I first would like to thank Arnold Ventures, Vital Projects at Proteus, and the MacArthur Foundation for their generous support of, of not only this event, but so many of the efforts across the country to advance justice. I also would, uh, again, like to thank all of you for being here. It truly is inspiring that people from different walks of life uh, if you look around, if you have time to mingle at our reception, um, you'll see the variety of people we have here that you come together to commemorate the anniversary of Gideon first Wainwright. You being here is so illustrative of the fact that our, our speakers have been making this afternoon that fulfilling the promise of Gideon is not just a concern for public defense providers or even people seeking to reform this country's criminal legal system. It is something that touches every sector of our society, and it is something about which every sector of our society should care. NLADA brings together advocates across the legal spectrum who see firsthand how people with few economic means are drawn into the criminal legal system, the criminalization of homelessness, for example, and how outcomes for people with criminal legal issues can determine whether people are able to move on and build safe and stable lives or become trapped in an unrelenting cycle that undermines our communities. Again, one common news example is the effect of criminal records on the ability to actually acquire housing. And our country's history means that p people living in or near poverty are disproportionately people of color, as well as disproportionately regulated and policed and drawn into the criminal legal system. That's something we can't forget here or in the work that we do every day. And so we really don't have time to delve deeply into these systemic features today. They are at the heart of why public defenders are critical to ensuring not only fairness in proceedings, but defending liberty and ensuring justice and peace in the lives of individuals and our society. Fulfilling Gideon's promise and ensuring that everyone has access to quality public defense, regardless of the ability to pay, not only is a constitutional right, but it ensures that individuals families and communities are able to see, lead safe, stable, and prosperous lives. It's why it's all of our duty, every level of government, every sector of society, to ensure we are appropriately resourcing and supporting strong public defense in communities across the country. <laughs> Today's program is about how we can do that. We will uplift the many committed public defenders toiling across the country. And we will dig into the real life impact good and bad, our current system has. We've heard about efforts led by the Justice Department. We'll hear about some additional efforts. Um, we are grateful to have Director Rossi here with us as well. Um, later on in the program, we'll also hear about federal legislation led by Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici and Senator Cory Booker to create a $250 million investment in public for state and local public defense across the country. This is the first time in history that we have seen efforts to advance such a federal, public, federal investment in public defense. It's a historic step forward. Most importantly today, we'll discuss ways in which we can do better. We'll hear perspectives about how we can make this group broader so that we can move forward together. So thank you again for joining us today. Um, I, I know that uh, our, our panelists are, are, uh, <laughs> are, are desperate to leave our head table, and so I will allow you to do that. Um, see, ready, ready to leave our head table. I will allow you to do that. Um, I will thank everyone again for joining us today, and I'm gonna transition right into our, our first panel um, and call those panelists up to, to this head table. Thank you again, Stan, Lisa, Kita. Oh, Stan, you have to stay. Thank you all. Just thank you all for joining us. Um, 
this afternoon, I think I am going to step back and, and become a, a moderator here um, and allow you to really tell your stories and introduce yourselves. Let me just frame our panel a little bit um, and what we hope to accomplish. We, we are, as everyone has, has said, using today to celebrate public defenders across the country, thanking everyone for their dedicated service. But we don't want to let this anniversary go by um, without not just highlighting the great work of public defenders, but also the serious challenges that they face every day in trying to do that work. Most Americans believe, and this is, you know, this is general public opinion, that if you are involved in the criminal legal system and cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed for you. We in this room know that is not what plays out in many places across the country. We also know that in many places across the country, people are charged for their appointed attorney. This practice of charging counsel fees is a vestige of under-resourcing public defense. The result often is practical denial of a right to attorney. It's also another way people are trapped into the system and the cycle of the system. And I, I want to acknowledge the work of, of the Fines and Fees Justice Center, who I know is here, um, who has been a tremendous partner to, to all of us in trying to address this issue of council fees across the country. So this panel is going to talk about the factors that underlie public defenders' ability to effectively do their jobs. We'll see the contrast between outcomes, both in terms of legal outcomes as well as life outcomes for clients and the communities in which they live. When public defenders are limited in the services they may provide, as opposed to when they have resources to do their work most effectively. One of the things we try to do at NLADA, and again, why we care about public defense, is the impact, the real life impact that it has on the lives of people across the country. And so we are going to start with Regina this afternoon. Um, Regina, first, of course, introduce yourself. Thank you for being here. Um, we would love to hear about your experience in the criminal legal system. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Regina Kelly. I am from Texas, Hearn, Texas, at that um, small little country town outside of Houston, Texas, if you've never heard of it. Um, currently, I am working for Lone Star Legal Aid um, in Texas. Um, as the client service coordinator, and I cover 73 counties um, currently. Um, my experience with my court-appointed attorney, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so if you're not aware, uh, there is a movie made about me. The name of it is American Violet. And American Violet shares my story and my experience with the um, criminal justice system. And I had a court-appointed attorney who was he just didn't care. He didn't have time for me as a client. Um, he, I met him that one time in court and I never saw him again. I ended up having to go through my case process by myself uh, with something that I just saw on Law and Order on TV, um, trying to defend myself. Um, he, yeah, he, yeah, he wasn't the best. And I, I tell everybody, it's, I feel like it was like that because he was new in town. And being that we're from a small town, he was trying to make a name for himself, his practice. He didn't want to step on the toes of our DA our, that we had at the time who ran everything in the town. He ran the churches, the schools, the businesses. Like, he had control over everything. So if you wanted a lucrative practice, you just go alone and get along um, in order for you to survive. Um, but I, I learned a lot. You know, I, I learned a lot. Um, through that process. I learned so much about the criminal justice system. I was forced to teach myself um, and just go with right is right and wrong is wrong to just defend myself um, in my case matter. How far would you like me to go into it? <laughs> I mean, as, as, as much as you're, you're willing to go um, into it, I think people would be welcome to hear, but I think really what your perception I think it would of be helpful to know okay. what your what based on your experience. So my how charge you feel. Um, in my case, it was um, distributing of controlled substance in a no school zone because I lived in the projects. I was a young mother, twenty four, four children, and where we lived in the apartment complex, the school was right across the street. So in that case, that whole drug bus because we had these annual drug busts every year. In that case, all twenty seven 
defendants had my address. They used my address in order to enhance the charge in the no school zone. It was so bogus. Even my name on the indictment, it wasn't even my name, it was Jennifer, a girl named Jennifer. Um, it, it was it was very bogus, and it was something that we were used to. Like it happened every year. Like we knew it was happening, and it always happened around October or early November because no one wants to stay in jail for the holidays. You have Thanksgiving, you have Christmas, so you'll take the plea deal so you can come home for the holidays. You know, and it's an impoverished um, community. Like you don't have the money <clears throat> to go and find you a, an attorney that's going to fight on your behalf. You just take the probation you know, or a couple of years in jail and you come home and just keep your head down and act like everything's okay. And at the time it had been going on for at least 12 years at the time. Um, and then that, that year when it happened, it was like, no, I'm, I'm not taking this. I didn't do this. I don't hang around people that do do these things. This is not me. I'm not taking this charge. Um, so my court appointed attorney, being that he didn't want to get involved and he didn't want to help me type thing, I just asked him to just go and get the evidence so I'll know what type of evidence they use, you know. And he ended up doing that after a couple of weeks. He brought it back to me. And it was a case of two men sitting on the couch arguing over a basketball game that they were watching on TV. So that's what they used in front of the grand jury to indict me on, two men arguing over a basketball game. And so I was like, no, like, duh, this is not me. Like, they have nothing. Like, I should be able to go home, but that still wasn't good enough. Um, the DA insisted that I take a, uh, a um, lie detector test in which I passed everything that they asked, but I failed my name. He insisted that my name was Jennifer. Um, and so I, I failed that part. And being that I failed that part, and I did the lie detector test without my attorney because he went on vacation at the time, and he said he wasn't going to be uh, available for it. Um, I went back to jail, <laughs> you know, and the only way I got out was because my mom was able to get the bond reduced and get me home type thing. And after that, like, I was my own advocate for myself until the ACLU stepped in. Uh, like, this is wrong. We read about this way across the other country, and country. like, this is, this is not right. Like, we want to step in and do a suit on your behalf type thing. Um, my court appointed attorney, to this day, after that, he was in practice for a couple of years, not successfully. He's not in practice now. Let's be clear about that. Um, but he could, I feel like he just, he didn't care about my life because it was my life that was on the line. Like I, like I said, I was a young mother, four children. My baby was just one month old. She was just one month. And to be away from them and go through all that process, like had you took the time out to get to know me as your client, listen to me as your client, then maybe you would have had some kind of, I don't want to say sympathy, but maybe you would have cared a little bit about my case. I feel like court-appointed court attorneys, I used to have a bad, like I didn't feel good about them. I, I had no faith in, in court-appointed attorneys because I just felt like your caseload is so large, you don't have time to just look at each case as an individual. You just don't have the time. And I get that and I understand that. But at the end of the day, we're all human. There's a human on the end of that caseload. There's a human life that's going to be affected. My children's life was going to be affected. My, my family, like everything around me was going to be affected. And for you not to care, that's, you can't just go home and sleep good at night. Because at the end of the day, this person might be locked up. I, could, I, I was in jail for a while, you know what I'm saying? Because you just decided you didn't want to care. And we cannot, we cannot, we cannot have practice like that. I feel like court appointed attorneys are the most overworked attorneys in this world. Now that I have learned this process and now that I've been exposed to so much, I feel like your caseloads are so large that it's not that you don't care because I feel like you wouldn't have got in this field if you didn't care. It's just you don't have the time to invest into each individual case the way you would like to. And somehow, some way, we need to work on some kind of plan in order to change that. Because like I said before, there's a human life attached to that caseload. Thank you so much, You're welcome. Regina. Um, so uh, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, and I think you really raised so many valid points, but so also demonstrated for us what happens mm -hmm. um, in real life when an attorney doesn't have the time or the resources 
necessary to truly consult with clients. Um, but also what that does, I think, as the attorney general pointed out, to people's trust, um, trust in their advocates and in our system. And so I'm going to ask you, Stan, to really follow up on that and speak on a broader level. What happens when people never get to talk to a defense attorney, which we know happens, um, or get that too late in the process or don't even get the time, you know, get the adequate time with their attorney? Um, I think Regina just kind of summed up what happens when you don't have access to good counsel uh, to a properly funded uh, public defender office, to an independent advocate. Because what I hear in that story is the importance of institutional defense. Right? Here we are in a small town where you have an attorney right, who's worried about the district attorney and you know, not wanting to ruffle feathers. What about the jurisdictions where you only have one judge in the county? And the private bar is relying on that one judge to assign them cases. How much are they going to push back against the judge and against the system? And so what I will do is juxtapose that horror story that Regina lived with something that we recently had occurred in New York City in our office. And to illustrate that when we talk about funding public defense, it's not just attorneys. It's social workers, it's paralegals, it's our admin staff, it's our investigators. And in New York City, we're lucky enough that we appear at first appearance, which doesn't happen in a lot of counties. So somebody in New York gets arrested, within 24 hours they see a judge, one of my lawyers, they're there. And we had an individual who was facing a serious felony charge and just absolutely disputed the prosecutor's version of events and told our lawyer, if you go and get the video camera, it will show that I'm right. So from arraignments, the investigator called and reached out to the, invest I'm sorry, the attorney reached out to the investigator on call that day. The investigator went, went to the bodega, got the video, said, backs up our client's story 100%. The judge that was ready to set bail on that individual that day ended up releasing the client. Five days later, the client's case was dismissed. Now imagine if you don't have an attorney at first appearance. You're sitting in jail and you're waiting maybe five days, six days. If you're in New Orleans, maybe 10 days before you see a lawyer. Maybe then on the third week, you get an investigator, but when the investigator goes to the bodega, guess what? The videotape's been erased. Yeah. Now what do you do? Now it's he said versus he said. Now it's months in jail. And what's the impact on that person's family? What if that person had a job and they now lost a job? And who's providing for the family, right? So what does effective quality representation look like? It's counsel at first appearance. It's the availability of a team approach where you have those investigators and those social workers on call. Sometimes in arraignments, we see a client who's obviously going through withdrawal and addiction. And again, the judge is like, well, you know, I can't trust this person to come back. You know, he's obviously not doing well. I'm going to set bail. Well, what if you can call a social worker at the office, find this person a program Right? And then tell the judge, if you release this person, we have a program that is ready to take this person right now. That person will be escorted and be put into treatment. Now they're not sitting in jail. Now their family's not affected in the same way. So investment in public defense, it's not just about the individual. I would argue it is a public safety issue. Because if that person is getting the help they need and they're not just being released or maybe somebody posts bail for them, right? Then maybe they're not committing another petty larceny because they're getting the treatment they need. So isn't everyone in society better off when we have a well-funded public defender office? And unfortunately, Regina's story is not an aberration. If you didn't believe it, you'd think it was a movie. Well, it turned out they actually made a movie <laughs> about her life because it's so outrageous. But this is happening in this vast country, in states throughout. And it's all because we don't fund public defense the way it needs to be funded. Thank you, Stan. Uh, Heather, how are you? <laughs> um, Heather, PDS here in DC. Um, 
is often cited nationally as, as a model for other offices to, to follow. Um, and I think Stan made the point earlier and uh, that no matter where you are, public defense is under-resourced, underfunded. So I will use the term relative to other offices across the country, you may have more adequate resources. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what that means for the outcomes you're able to accomplish for your clients? Absolutely. So first, um, so I'm day 185 into this amazing job as being able to be the director. And no part of this can start with, for me, without paying homage to people like Joanne Wallace, who's here with us. Joanne had the vision years ago to figure out a way to get PDS into a place where we had our own autonomy. We would receive funding that is, uh, compared to most jurisdictions, great, right, in terms of how we take care of our clients and our lawyers. And it started for us, I do believe, this ability to be more client-centered and do what we needed to do on behalf of our clients. And so we are very thankful for that. What that means for us is very much sort of a combination of the things that Regina and Stan talk to. We meet our clients the day that they come into lockup, and we do not leave them, right? The reality of it is we bring a team to all of our clients. We have on staff social workers, investigators. I have DNA experts. I have forensic fellows. I have tons of experts and mitigation specialists. I have an appeals division a special litigation division. That is the division for us that, for instance, deals with more systematic issues. So in addition of trying to take care of our clients in their criminal cases, we are worried about what is happening, for instance, at the jails where they will remain. I have a community defender organization that not only helps with things like expungement, but they also represent our clients when they are in these federal facilities because DC does not have a state sort of local facility where we stay, and our clients can be sent anywhere within this country. And so our lawyers in that division take care of them. So when we talk about what the difference can be, it is with the understanding that PDS has been given the opportunity and taken in other places, the ability to make sure that we humanize our clients, that the ability to give them client-centered representation that they deserve um, is something that is expected. Um, as much as we sort of fight with the judges, for instance, it is expected that they know when a client has PDS the level of representation that they have. If we need to fly in experts on cases, we've been able to figure out mm -hmm. how to do that. We've been able to, you know, even establish the ability to help clients upon release. So I do think that the benefits of what Stan is talking about and how that could play should not be unique to just our jurisdictions or those mm -hmm. where we've had the opportunity to sort of have that autonomy. It is something that every client in this country deserves. Well, thank you. Um, so I think we're gonna come back to you, Regina, if you're, if you're ready. Um, you know, we've, we've heard what, you know, obviously, thank you again for sharing your experience. I, I guess the question I'm going to ask for of you right now is, as someone who's had that experience, mm -hmm. what would effective assistance of counsel mean to you? What would you have loved your public defender to be able to do that would have changed your perception of how the system treated you? Know my name. <laughs> um, know my name listen to me without rushing off because you're in a hurry to go do something else um and just making me feel like because my life is in your hands so i need to know you care and i get it public defenders are so busy and they have so much going their caseloads are so give me the tools to help myself and my family help me we can go investigate we can go get anything you need while you're busy doing this and doing that give us a task list as to the things that you need us to work on things that we can accomplish that'll make it easier for you you know in your case and then we report back like give us have some kind of system in play where we can help you with the work that need to be done um but just not caring is, is that's not 
no, like that, that's not going to work for anybody. It's so many people in the world that just do not believe in public defenders because they have been burned in so many ways. And where I'm from, you're not going to ask a public defender to defend you in court. You're going to be like, no, I got to come up some kind of way. I'm going to sell my house to go and get me an attorney because a paid attorney is going to fight for me harder than a public defender. And I hear people say, I used to think that. I was one of those people. And I hear people say that right now, and I'm like, no, don't think like that. Like, there are public defenders out there that will fight for you, you know, but you have to speak and empower yourself with this public defender. Like, you can talk. You don't have to just sit there and just listen to what they tell you and go with whatever they say. Like, you have a voice in this because this is your life as well. Like, our community, we have to learn how to empower ourselves to help ourselves. But as a public defender, I will really, the plan that you guys have, girl, <laughs> like really, like they need that across the world. Cause like if we had that everywhere, can you imagine, can you imagine how many people that are sitting in prison right now because they took a plea deal because their public defenders are telling them, well, this is the best I can do, you know, or I think this would be good. Cause my public defender told me I had never been in trouble anything. He was like, you're such a good person. You do good. Just go ahead and take the plea deal. You get to go home to your kids. I'm like, but I'm going to get evicted from public right. housing. Like, no more food stamps. Right. No working anywhere. Like, there's a domino effect to that. Like, you have to understand it. And why would you ask me to plea out to something that I did not do? Like, common sense. Like, why would you do that? Why would you recommend that? So, I mean, it's I just ask public defenders just care about your caseload. Care about them because we are human. Thank we, you. we are human. Thank you, Regina. And I think, you know, you've brought up, you brought up earlier and, and now also it's kind of like you, ha you have had this experience, but also then, but now I know all these other things, yes. right? And that first initial impact is so important, I think, um, you know, to kind of shaping what people think of public defenders, as you've, as you've, as you've explained, but also knowing what's behind that um, also helps kind of our understanding of, of how, to, how to move forward. And uh, you are a great transition to the next question because you touched on kind of all these collateral consequences is what people talk about. I mean, we, talk, we at NL8AA just talk about it as a spectrum. You know, there is no distinction between civil and criminal issues um, for people who are drawn into the system every day. So I'm going to turn back to you, Heather, and kind of provide, the, provide for us the attorneys perspective on why this is a reality, Regina's reality is a reality for so many people. Um, what's, what's, what are the factors behind that? And talk a little bit about what you touched on earlier, which is the concept of holistic defense. Sure. So the, I think Regina hit it right on the head, right? You have to have defenders that actually see their clients as people. Um, when she spoke about, like, how is somebody sleeping at night, that's kind of the thing that, like, you know someone's n never really done this work. If they're like, oh, I sleep well. Because if right. you represent someone and you know that they're in prison, that's never a nice sleep for you and you're often trying to figure out how to, to free them. So holistic for us has often meant trying to figure out all of these collateral consequences and figuring out how we can meet the needs of the clients, right? Often people say, if I get arrested, that would be the first thing that I would be worried about every day. But that's unrealistic for many of our clients, right? The criminal thing might be the eighth thing that they're worried about. They're worried about their jobs their kids, how they will survive. If I take this plea, can I get financial aid later, right? Will I lose the food stamps that I need? If I take this drug conviction, will I lose the license that allows me to drive to work to make the money that I need to be able to take care of our clients, I mean, my family? So for us, it is about figuring out a way to holistically do all those things. The rub for many defenders, and I think Regina's spoken this too, right? That is a lot for a lawyer to try to sort out, and God forbid if they are trying to do that by themselves, right? So this team and holistic approach is the hope that we can bring in other professionals in those things who can provide us, whether it's immigration assistance, whether it's a social worker that can find me the program that I need for this client while I'm working on the case part, and us be able to work together as a team. And most defenders don't have that. 
And where that happens and what that leads to is a client being able to only get the part of the defender that the defender can give. So maybe the defender's like, here's the thing, I can really investigate Regina's case and figure out what needs to be done. But if she wants to know what the collateral consequences are for all these other things with the housing or help her get into a job program or be able to figure out what's going to happen with CFSA if something goes wrong with her kids, I can't do all that. And so as we think about how we approach public defenders, it's not just, and Stan touched on this, just funding the lawyer part. That part is extremely important. But we are part, if we do this well, of a team. And that team has to consist of the things that we know that our clients need in order to survive this system. And quite honestly, even the conversation now is if we're free and pluck them out before they have a conviction and these things have long-term um, sort of effects, if they st get stuck in and they come out, what also are we doing to make sure as they've re-entered society, which kind of crazy, they never really left, we decided to push them out. But if when they're back, what services are we putting in place to make sure that they're allowed to continue in their yes. lives so that has to happen too thank you Heather um, so the big question I think Stan is how do we do it <laughs> you can say that you've got the mic you've got we the mic make it a priority I mean that's that's what it's about it's 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 about what we value, and if legislators think that funding public defense is an inconvenience, something that they just have to do, that if we just give them the bare minimum to survive, we're meeting our Gideon obligation, these problems are going to continue. And you know, the Attorney General touched on the issue of recruitment and retention. Uh, coming out of this pandemic, there are large programs, uh, traditionally successful programs that are struggling. Folks do not want to do this work. Mm -hmm. Folks are not willing to do this work for $50,000 with a quarter million dollars in law school debt. And you can't blame them. And so when we talk about uh, a wage, we're talking about a living wage. Nobody here is suggesting that a public defender needs to be making, I don't know what, somebody from my alma mater, NYU, who goes to a big firm, is probably at $210,000, $220,000. It's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a fraction of that, right? And so, you know, it's about providing a living wage. A public defender should not have to choose at year five whether to do the work they love or leave because they want to have a child. Right. A public defender in my office should not be in my office in tears saying, I don't want to leave, but I want to buy a house. Mm -hmm. And that is the conversation I have over and over with folks who are in their third, fourth, and fifth year. It's just not right that that's the choice that they have to make. But that's the reality of an underfunded public defender office. And so the attorney general you know, touched on the Equal Defense Act. This was a piece of legislation that was introduced by then Senator uh, Kamala Harris. Uh, it has now been picked up by uh, Senator Booker. We're gonna hear some remarks from uh, Congresswoman Susan Bonamici. Uh, but it is an investment. But for me, it's more than an investment. It's an example. It's the federal government saying, we don't have to fund state public defense, but we value it. It's a priority, and we're going to do it. And so when states see that the federal government is doing that, right, perhaps they'll look at their budgets and say, you know what? We need to prioritize this as well. Thank you. Um, any, any, any last comments anyone would like to um, I would like to encourage all public defenders, if there are any public defenders in here, like, please continue to do the work. You would not be in this field if you did not have a passion for it. And I know sometimes it gets hard, and I know sometimes you're forced to make some hard choices and decisions about your career um, because the money is just not adding up right. I just ask that at the end of the day, you continue to remember why you initially got into this field, and it was to help indigent clients and just keep pushing yourself just a little further. And I have faith in our justice system that eventually we're going to get on the right track where our funding is great, and you guys are going to be paid the way you need to be paid, the way you deserve to be paid, because I feel like public defenders are the most underworked, underpaid, overworked, underpaid attorneys there are. 
I, and I believe in that sincerely. No one can handle the caseloads that you guys handle. Um, and you are needed. So please stay encouraged. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Please, uh, well, we just gave them a hand, but please give our panelists another hand as they leave the table. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name's David Miller. I'm Deputy Policy Director at NLADA. Um, I'm really excited to present a short video message from Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici. Uh, earlier um, and just now, you heard a bit about the Equal Defense Act um, and current legislation um, that would really be historic and, and make a significant difference um, to state and local public defense. Um, in the House, Suzanne Bonamici is uh, the sponsor of that legislation, the Equal Defense Act. We are so grateful to her for her sponsorship. Um, and we really believe that people here in Washington are starting to understand the urgency of the need to address this. Um, the Congresswoman's leadership has played a major role in that. Uh, she's a long-standing champion of equal justice and public defense specifically, having also led efforts in Congress to secure funding for federal public defenders in recent years. Uh, so we are really pleased now to share her message with you all today. Hello, I'm Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici from Oregon. I appreciate the opportunity to mark the momentous 60th anniversary of Gideon versus Wainwright. Thank you to the Legal Aid and Defender Association for your tireless advocacy to secure the right to counsel in our country and for our ongoing partnership in support of public defense. Gideon is a foundational part of our legal history. The constitutional right to counsel in a criminal case is fundamental to our democracy. And without Gideon, indigent defense would not exist in its current form. I started my legal career at Legal Aid, where I learned through the clients and their stories that people don't struggle by choice. And I understand the importance of representation and of the Sixth Amendment. And I also know that an important part of access to justice is access to counsel, which is why I'm working in Congress to help break down the barriers and close the gaps in access to counsel. The country is experiencing a crisis in our public defense system. We have a dangerous shortage of public defenders, and the public defenders we do have are struggling under burdensome caseloads and conditions. Soon I will be reintroducing the Equal Defense Act, which is a meaningful step forward to help solve the crisis. My legislation will provide funding to hire more public defenders, and it recognizes the essential work of public defenders by improving their compensation and establishing reasonable workload limits. Every member of Congress takes an oath to support and defend the Constitution, and that includes the Sixth Amendment, a person's right to counsel. The criminal justice system cannot operate without public defenders, and access to counsel should be at the forefront of legislators who want to address public safety and crime. I've been asked many times about who is affected by the shortage of public defenders, and the answer is all of us. It hurts defendants who have a constitutional right to counsel. It hurts crime victims, and it undermines our public's trust in the judicial system. As the Supreme Court, led by Justice Black, wrote 60 years ago, that government hires lawyers to prosecute and defendants who have the money hire lawyers to defend are the strongest indication of the widespread belief that lawyers in criminal cases are necessities, not luxuries. The right of one charged with a crime to counsel may not be deemed fundamental and essential to fair trials in some countries, but it is in ours. So on this anniversary of Gideon, I urge you to call your representatives, contact them, ask them, to join me in this effort to secure the right to counsel. Through the work you're doing and by making your voices heard on Capitol Hill, we can and will secure the resources our public defenders and people in the criminal, criminal justice system need and deserve. Thank you again for this opportunity to help mark the 60th anniversary of Gideon and to highlight our shared commitment to justice for all. So from one former public defender in government to another, it is now my honor to introduce Rachel Rossi. 
the director of the Office of Access to Justice that the Attorney General alluded to during his remarks. She has served in that capacity since May of 2022. Director Rossi began her career as a public defender in Los Angeles for almost a decade. She practiced in the Los Angeles County Public Defender's Office, the Office of the Los Angeles County Alternate Public Defender, and the Federal Public Defender's Office for the Central District of California, where she vigorously defended hundreds of low-income clients in state and federal courts. Director Rossi then served as counsel to Senate Judiciary Committee Chair Richard J. Dubin of Illinois, where she was the lead staffer on the First Step Act, a major U.S. federal criminal justice reform bill signed into law in 2018 that created comprehensive sentencing and prison reforms. She then transitioned to the role of counsel to the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on the Judiciary, the Subcommittee on Crime, Terrorism, and Homeland Security, working for then Crime Subcommittee Chair Karen Bass of California. That's a lot of subcommittees. <laughs> she then served as the legal director for the Reform Alliance, where she launched the development of a litigation program for a direct representation in criminal and civil litigation matters surrounding issues around probation, parole, supervised release, and community supervision. Prior to her appointment at ATJ, Director Rossi served as Deputy Associate Attorney General in the Office of the Associate Attorney General, Vanita Gupta. In that role, she also served as the inaugural Anti-Hate Coordinator for the Justice Department. In her current role, Rachel Rossi leads the Justice Department's lead office on ensuring that people who cannot afford a lawyer have access to counsel in criminal and civil courts nationwide. Please welcome Director Rossi. Thank you, Stan, for that very warm introduction. Um, thank you, Radhika, and to NLADA for putting on this critical event, NAPD, NACDL, um, to all of the leaders, David, um, April, who I know couldn't be here, um, thank you for your commitment. I also wanna just pause and thank all of the public defenders and public defense advocates in this room. Defenders have the privilege to stand as the guardian of constitutional rights for the people. Defenders are sometimes the only voice for the voiceless. They pursue dignity and humanity for the most vulnerable, and most often, as I know we've heard and will continue to hear, they pursue this with little recognition, little pay, and insufficient resources. So thank you. Today, I want to talk about an individual who bravely stood up for access to counsel for the accused, a person who saw the imbalance of the system and advocated for a more level playing field, a person who fought for the establishment of a lawyer at no cost for those charged in criminal cases. That person, you may be surprised to hear, is not Clarence Gideon. That person is Clara Shortridge Fultz. 50 years before the Gideon decision, a woman named Clara also fought for the establishment of public defense. In 1876, Clara's husband abandoned her and her five children, a devastating blow for a woman in the 19th century. But Clara decided in a startling twist that she wanted to become a lawyer. She was called foolish. She was told that a woman's place is in the home and at the time, only white male citizens were allowed to become lawyers in the state of California where she lived. But Clara did not take no for an answer. She drafted a state bill that would allow women to become lawyers in the state of California, succeeded, and was the first female lawyer on the entire West Coast and the third female attorney in the United States. She applied to law school, but she was denied admission because, you guessed it, women were not allowed. Again, Clara did not give up. She helped to write and advocate for two unprecedented clauses that were included in the California Constitution, guaranteeing equal access to employment and education for women and winning her lawsuit to be admitted to law school. Clara is most known, however, for pioneering the creation of the Public Defender Office. Early on in her career, she represented many indigent clients in criminal cases, and she was just shocked. The injustices that she saw, the prosecutorial misconduct, 
seeing inexper inexperienced defense lawyers, schemes even to take advantage of vulnerable defendants, and the incredibly large power imbalance between the prosecution and the person accused. And Clara just couldn't accept it. She pushed for the idea of a government-funded public defender office, and she advocated to make that vision real. In 1893, she presented her concept at the Congress of Jurisprudence and Law Reform at the Chicago World's Fair. She later drafted a model statute and campaigned for its introduction in numerous state legislatures. At the time, it was a revolutionary and a bold idea, and Clara was met with active opposition. But she succeeded. The first public defender office in this country opened in Los Angeles in 1914. Then the Fultz Defender Bill was adopted in 1921 in California statewide, 50 years before Gideon versus Wainwright. Let me say that again. The first public defender office was established 50 years before having a public defender was recognized as a constitutional right by the Supreme Court because of one woman who was committed to breaking down the barriers that she saw when she went into courtrooms. What Clara Shortridge Fultz and Clarence Gideon really have in common was that they had the perspective to see the injustices in the system, but they also had the ability to see beyond those injustices and to dream of and demand more. It is with this conviction that the Office for Access to Justice, our office, is pursuing our mission. As Attorney General Garland said in 2021, he reestablished the Office for Access to Justice as a standalone office within the Justice Department. Our mission is to dismantle the barriers to accessing the promises and the protections of our civil and criminal legal systems. And I'm proud that this mission really is one of Attorney General Garland's highest priorities, which is evident by him joining us here today. A very critical component of our office's mission is to serve as the principal legal advisor for the department on the constitutional right to counsel and other rights guaranteed under the Sixth Amendment. Our work is to support public defense. And with this mandate, we are working to elevate the voices of public defenders and impacted communities because your perspective is unique and critical. Your view into the criminal legal system can uniquely inform innovative and new visions for reform of the system. So in that spirit, when we uh, were approaching the 60th anniversary of Gideon, our office wanted to think through how do we talk about this 60th anniversary in a different way? Not just another event in Washington, DC, which we love, and we are gonna have uh, one of those tomorrow, and we have been to all of the fantastic events, but we wanted to take our voice and our work and bring it to action. We wanted to be in the field to listen from and hear from defenders and impacted communities to demonstrate the department's commitment to including the voices and experiences of public defenders in the conversation. We wanted to go across the country and look at and highlight what what is the state of public defense? Where are the resource gaps? Where are we 60 years later? But we also wanted to highlight the innovations. What's going well? Who's doing the right thing? How do we elevate that and support that? So like Attorney General Garland said, we launched the tour in Florida where the Gideon case originated. We were pleased that the number two Justice Department official joined us on that launch. Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco kicked off the tour by emphasizing the central role that defense counsel play in our criminal justice system and the responsibility of all who work in the department to uphold Gideon's promise, not just the Office for Access to Justice. That includes the role of the Bureau of Prisons in promoting access to counsel for those in custody. And the Deputy Attorney General announced a comprehensive 100-day review to ensure consistent, timely access to counsel in Bureau of Prisons pretrial facilities. We then traveled to Tulsa, Oklahoma, where we met with the organization Still She Rises, and I know many of you may know Aisha McWay. There we learned about holistic defense models, like the models that we talked about today, that look at a person accused in a criminal system beyond just a criminal case and look at what are the services outside of the criminal justice system that they need that we can provide to make them whole. 
We then visited the Muscogee Creek Nation to hear about the unique challenges that are faced by tribal defenders. And then we went to Las Vegas, Nevada, where again, it was an honor to be joined by Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division, Kenneth Polite. There we met with law students at the law school and we talked about the importance of public defense as a profession and as a career. We also announced collaborative efforts between the Office for Access to Justice and the Criminal Division to expand public defense globally and to promote public defense as a career in the United States. We then went to Nashville, Tennessee, where I was pleased to be joined by Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General Amy Solomon for the Office of Justice Programs, where we really listened and heard about resource gaps and need. We also announced the joint issuance of a Dear Colleague letter that clarified to the states that the Burn JAG federal grant funding money can be used to resource public defense. Then we concluded the tour, privileged to be joined by Associate Attorney General Vanita Gupta in Des Moines, Iowa, where we talked about contract att attorney defender models, which I think are often overlooked in the conversation about public defense, rural defense and unique issues faced in rural jurisdictions, and also public defender assessments and the fees that can be assessed against uh, people who are supposed to have free representation. There, the Associate Attorney General announced that the Office for Access to Justice will establish a new role solely dedicated to support for state and local public defense. This attorney will continue this type of comprehensive engagement with the public defense community regularly. This attorney will do things like lead the development of guidance and best practices on critical issues faced by defenders. And this attorney will be a resource and a contact for the public defense community to reach out to. This attorney will also help to assist our office in launching a robust Sixth Amendment statement of interest practice. So on this tour, our priority was to listen. We wanted to hear from defenders. We wanted to hear from impacted communities about their experiences. We wanted to do that because defenders have a unique and critical perspective. What you see every day in your cases is not only relevant, but it's essential to the decisions that we will make to improve our justice system. Too frequently, policymakers pursue reforms with little understanding of what the impact would be for the actual people sitting in the courtroom. Policymakers make decisions without ever having walked into a lockup or knowing what it feels like to know that your liberty may be gone. But you have that understanding. That perspective is not only valuable, it is critical to the conversation. And when that experience and perspective is combined with an unapologetic demand for the truest ideal of equal justice, that is when our systems change. So I'll close by telling you a story of one of my favorite clients when I was a public defender. As a young public defender, I had a client who was houseless, had mental health issues, and everyone knew him in the courthouse because he would consistently show up being charged with misdemeanor charges for sleeping on the sidewalk. And he would always be on time, and he would always come to his court dates with his shopping bag full of his citations dutifully for every arraignment. And as a young public defender, I told him what the system options were. You can either plead guilty or we can fight the case at trial. And I was very excited to fight all of his cases at trial. I told him, I dare jury to lock you up for this. Let's go. <laughs> and every time he told me, I choose neither. And again, I would tell this client every time he came back to court with new citations, I, I understand. I know this is injustice. I know this isn't right. But these are your only two options. Either you plead guilty or we'll fight the case. And he continued to tell me, no, that's not justice. This client knew that a system that would force him to obtain a criminal conviction for not having a home and a bed was not justice. But he also knew that spending weeks in back-to-back -back trials was simply not justice either. That client taught me an invaluable lesson about the mission of justice that I've carried with me throughout my career. That lesson was that this pursuit often requires us to reimagine our systems. It requires us to push for visions that others may not yet see as possible. 
It requires us to stubbornly refuse to accept a widening justice gap, to creatively and boldly push for more, and to demand the promised ideals of equal access to justice until they are realized. We at the Office for Access to Justice know that there are changes we can make to our systems. We believe there are solutions we can craft to support and improve public defense and resources for public defense. We also believe there are innovations that we can encourage to change the narrative about public defense so that in 10 years at the 70th anniversary of Gideon, we're not having the same conversation. We know that we can pursue reform of our criminal justice system as a whole. But we cannot do it without the perspectives, the strategies, and the expertise from those on the front lines. And like Clara Shortridge Fultz, who did not wait for a Supreme Court opinion to fight for what she knew justice required, our office is challenging ourselves to approach our work with that same vigor and urgency. At the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, Clara said, let the criminal courts be reorganized upon a basis of exact, equal, and free justice. Let our country be broad and generous enough to make the law a shield as well as a sword. As we pursue this mission to fully realize the protections of our laws as a sword and a shield for all, our office looks forward to being your supporter, your collaborator, and your partner and we look forward to elevating your voice. So thank you again for the privilege of joining you today. Good afternoon. I am Kelly Thompson. I'm the State Public Defender for Wisconsin, and it is a privilege to be with all of you today. This is such an important uh, event to really honor not only the public defenders that are doing the work around the country, to talk about the difficult work that's being done, to talk about our clients that are so, so critically important to all of us, but to our stakeholders and partners in the community, and that will be our panel today. As that has been mentioned many times all day uh, today, we see the crushing workload our public defenders handle each and every day. But we know our clients are just people like all of us that struggle with challenges each and every day, and we are privileged to represent them, to represent them, and they are more than the actions that have brought them into the criminal legal system. We see those challenges including economic, educational housing, mental health, and substance abuse that our clients deal with with most of their lives. Public defenders with strong community relationships and stakeholder partnerships are uniquely positioned to identify the existence and consequences of systemic injustices in the provision of the right to counsel in the criminal legal system more broadly and to play a central role in developing and advocating for equitable solutions. I am excited to have such a diverse panel to talk with us about partnerships and effective policy change. With us today are Bhavan Sodi, Chief Program Officer of the Innocence Project, Neera Chatterjee, Vice President and Assistant General Counsel at U.S. Bank Corps, and Ronald Simpson Bay, Executive Vice President of Just Leadership USA. And we will start with our panelists. We'll start with uh, Ronald today, if that's OK, just to talk about real briefly how important these partnerships are, how important it is for us to work together, and how you see your own interest, role, or power in advancing reform. Wow, that's a great question. Thanks for having me today, and thanks for NLADA for, for uh, putting on this opportunity. The importance of um, Gideon versus Wainwright in connection to people like myself with lived experience cannot be understated, cannot be understated. Gideon is a, is a watershed moment for people who come in contact with the criminal legal system 
because, as Justice Black said, it's a necessity, not a luxury, to have legal representation in a court. And for somebody that's been in court, I can tell you from experience, that is, <laughs> that is truly an understatement. I was laughing because I was thinking about as I was preparing for this event to think about the United States currently houses 25% of the world's prison population. And we have right to counsel. If we didn't have right to counsel, how many people do you think we would be incarcerating these days? We'd have 75% of the world's population incarcerated. So for me, I think that you know to be at this table, to have this conversation of those with lived experiences is very important to me because those closest to the problem are closest to the solution. Thank you very much. Bhavan, would you like to go next and talk about your role as well? Sure. Uh, I thank you for the opportunity and also the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Innocence Project. The Innocence Project's power um, on this front comes from the fact that, you know, last fall we celebrated our 30th anniversary. And a part of that comes from the 275 plus DNA exonerations that the organization has contributed to. And what does that mean? Well, what that means is these cases allowed from policy perspective an opportunity for us to be able to establish the contributing factors to wrongful conviction. So things that we often suspected, you know, people of color overrepresented when it came to injustice, wrongful convictions, eyewitness misidentification, you know, we look at Gideon. Um, instances of inadequate defense, faulty forensics, jailhouse informants, and having biological proof that these factors contributed allows the Innocence Project and allows often policy organizations across the country to be able to utilize the real life stories of these individuals to exemplify the need for reform. And so for the Innocence Project, it's, it's an opportunity to not only represent these individuals, but to be able to pursue policy and justice initiatives in order to ensure that uh, we're able to contribute to, contribute to a better future moving forward. Thank you very much. Nira? Uh, uh, thanks. Um, first off, I want to express um, Jim's regrets for not being able to, to join today. He was really looking forward to, to being part of this conversation. Um, there's a lot going on in the banking sector right now. <laughs> um, so uh, I'd like to start by, by first acknowledging my deep gratitude to the public defenders in the room. I spent a summer um, at the public defender's office in Cook County, Illinois, and was overwhelmed, immediately overwhelmed, and uh, really, really thankful for, for all of your work. But I will say this is that um, regardless of, of where we sit and where our day-to-day -day practice takes us, as lawyers, we have a responsibility to promote justice and access to justice. And I think in Jim's role as general counsel and as an executive at U.S. Bank, uh, he has a tremendous amount of influence both internally and externally to promote equal access to the law. One of the ways he does this is through his commitment and leadership um, with, with NLADA and as chair of the uh, Corporate Advisory Committee. But to Stan's question, aren't we all better off if public defense is funded? I think the resounding answer to that question is yes. And the corporate community does support the Equal Defense Act and recognizes that the rule of law and Fair justice systems are critical to strong communities um, in which our businesses operate and our employees live and work. And it's really that lens that, that we bring to the conversation. Well, thank you. Thank you to all of you. Your answers were wonderful. Nir, I do want to say that I know you said you spent a summer in the Chicago Public Defender's Office. If you, Wisconsin's right next door. So if you ever want to, <laughs> to come over, please feel free. Anytime, anytime. Ronald, we'll start with you again. Your work and your organization are focus on amplifying the power of directly impacted people. And a lot of groups acknowledge the need to do that, but it's not always clear that they know how or go about it in a particularly focused or useful way. 
So what should that look like in terms of working with allies that might be public defenders or other groups working on reform? And do you have any examples of when this has worked really well for you? Absolutely, absolutely. The organization I work for is, is Just Leadership USA. We are the only national level criminal justice organization that was founded by and operated by formerly incarcerated people. Uh, we currently have over 1,400 leaders who have graduated our leadership development program in 45 states plus Washington, D.C., and we're doing a lot of great work around the country as criminal justice reform. And you, you talked about engaging um, the public or engaging directly impact the community around these issues. Um, I, would, I would lean on the fact that I would say the best way to engage people with lived experience is to treat them as people with lived experience. Treat them in the same vein as you would a person, a woman with uh, around lived experience of birth control, having children, your reproductive rights. Keir Gray, Keir Bradford Gray, who is uh, ran a public defense office in Philadelphia, I had the opportunity to go visit her program a few years ago as an example of what engagement looks like. Uh, she she created a program called the Haddington Participatory Defense Hub. They corroborated with an organization run by directly people called Why Not Prosper and a directly impacted community to create an alternative to cash bail in Philadelphia. Through community partnerships and community input, they were able to influence many decision-making processes of the courts that would allow better outcomes for the citizens. And as a result of that, they were able to not only assist people facing criminal charges in Philadelphia, avoid uh, being incarcerated by uh, having bail because they provide a support system, but they also, the people that were uh, assisted after they got out of the system, they were able to go back and become volunteers for the program. So it was a perpetual thing that helped the community be engaged, become stakeholders in this whole process around bail reform. Um, through this effort, they became, as I said, became stakeholders, and they became a great example of what we say in Just Leadership, those closest to the problem being closest to the solution. Thank you so much, and I just want to point out, Ronald is in Detroit, Michigan, which again is very close to Wisconsin, and he has been a leader in a number of our programs, even in Wisconsin. I, Shannon Ross, who is an individual who flew with me today, works on a number of nonprofits, including something called The Community, where they work with individuals in the reentry community, and they will be working with Ronald even this weekend on projects. So it really is important to not just stay within our cities, our state, but we can, we can do that nationally. So thank you, Ronald, for all of the work that you do. You really have impacted not just Michigan, um, but nationwide, so we really appreciate that. Bob, and your position on this panel is very interesting because you are in so many ways a partner stakeholder for the public defense community. For example, as an ally around policy reform, but you also are in the defense community. I want to focus on that part for now. So simply maybe you could tell us about the ways you work with defenders and why you do the work. So the Innocence Project is multifaceted. You know, we have our policy department, our post-conviction litigation department, our strategic litigation department, our science and research department, as well as our social work department. And our work, when we initially started, was solely committed to litigation, uh, representing individuals claiming to have been wrongfully convicted. And what it has resulted is a recognition of these other facets of our organization that were so necessary in order for us to be able to do our work. And so in my first response, when I talked about those 275 cases, the reason they're so vital is that not only for the individual that we represented, but what they meant for the community at large, what it meant for our constitutional rights at large. And so our policy department is often reliant on the experiences of these individuals to be able to put a face to what they advocate. And a lot of the policy initiatives we pursue are adjacent to helping public defenders when it comes to law reform efforts related to prosecutorial and police misconduct, when it comes to the recognition of the fragility of eyewitness misidentification, when it comes to instances of police officers being able to deceive young people during the course of uh, eliciting false confessions. And so it is interesting because the multifaceted nature of, of our organization has allowed us to also utilize that as an opportunity to be successful when we are pushing law reform efforts. Thank you very much. 
And again, Nira, thank you for all the work that you're doing and stepping in for Jim today. I know both of you have been just wonderful partners to us um, in our federal advocacy work, which is so, so critically important. And we've heard about that today from a number of our speakers. Your voice and that of your colleagues from the business community have been such a powerful force behind the attention that not only public defense, but criminal justice reform has had in recent years. Could you please talk about why you think you are able to be so impactful? And is this the main way you see your partnership, or are there other things that you could highlight? Sure, th thanks. F first off, I think um, let, let's get that Equal Defense Act pa passed be <laughs> before we say we've been hugely impactful. But we certainly, um, I, I think advocacy in, in particular is um, an area of, of focus, and I think um, is really sort of the collective action of the business community um, that, that can add to the chorus of voices on the front line and help amplify uh, and, and highlight uh, in a different way. Um, and, and so I do want to spend a couple of minutes talking a bit about um, the, I think, nearly four dozen corporate leaders that signed on to the Equal Defense Act, in, including U.S. Bank. Um, and, and we're not telling a story that, that hasn't been told. But again, I, I think the fact that the corporate community is, is highlighting that the lack of quality um, access to representation it can be a contributor to overuse of incarceration, uh, which disproportionately impacts communities of color um, and has a number of negative uh, consequences for, for the community. Um, and that it also impacts impacts the business community and our ability to rely on a predictable workforce. Again, we're not saying anything that hasn't already been told, but it joining uh, our, our voice sort of joining in the chorus of, of those voices on the front line, I think can be particularly um, impactful. Um, and, and sort of beyond, I, I guess, the advocacy piece, I, I do want to highlight the fact that, that U.S. Bank does have a legal department of 275 legal professionals that are mobilized to support pro bono efforts um, and other volunteer opportunities. And we have people that staff a monthly clinic through our uh, Minnesota Volunteer Lawyer Network to help facilitate um, criminal expungement. Uh, we also have done work with the, I'm sorry, I've got to rely on notes, the, the Great North uh, Innocence Project to provide um, support to their efforts to overturn wrongful convictions and prevent future wrongful convictions from occurring. Um, and, and that pro bono work is, is really hugely important um, and is really emphasized uh, within, within the organization. I would also like to note sort of outside of um, the pro bono work and the advocacy, um, we also work in partnership with organizations that facilitate equal access to the law and uh, e including civil legal aid. Um, and the U.S. Bank supports um, and has sponsored um, fellows um, through Equal Justice Works um, and um, have uh, and the fellows that we have supported have um, done a, a myriad of very impactful work, including um, supporting um, mothers on tribal communities struggling with o opioid use, um, supporting children and families involved in the child protection system, and advancing economic uh, justice for those who have disabilities. So again, I think sort of a, a myriad of different ways that we that we look to to support. Thank you very much. Just a real quick follow up to that because I think the business community is such a significant and impactful and powerful partner for public defense. Um, and you know, I, I in Wisconsin, it'll bring back to Wisconsin. We've seen we've seen some great strides forward, and I think a lot of it has to do with the workforce. Um, Workers, employers need employees, and a lot of our employees are sitting in cages. 
um, and should be back in the community um, working. And so I think we, we're seeing this partnership, but there's definitely, I think, from the business community, still some hesitation. And I don't know if it's hesitation. I don't think it's necessary hesitation on working with the individuals, but how to get engaged and how to get involved. So do you have some just simple words of advice when for the public defense community and how they can continue to work with those business leaders who are, I think, want to be involved, but just don't know quite how to be involved? Well, I, I think um, to that question, maybe it's a, a, a question of really where there's there's common ground. And, and maybe what I'd like to do, if I can, is, is spend a little bit of time sort of talking about what those common grounds can be. Um, and in particular, um, when, um, when we have shared interests, um, I, I would say we can, again, sort of work collectively or otherwise sort of amplify a public policy initiative. And I guess what I'd like to do is really focus on um, um, economic access for impacted communities um, in the banking industry. And so uh, this is a very, very specific, but I think, again, sort of, and and adjacent to, I guess, the public defender community, but a way in which I think we can find sort of tangible common ground and advance, um, advance reform um, is, is this particular area. So, for example, um, there have, has been uh, significant efforts to uh, re reduce barriers to employment um, for those that are impacted individuals. And um, I'd start with, I, I guess I should ground us a little bit in, in federal banking regulation. And under the, the Federal Deposit Insurance Act, of uh, uh, Section 19, um, uh, again, going to refer to my notes. Um, uh, individuals are generally prohibited um, from um, becoming employed by or participating in the affairs of an FDIC insured depository institution if they are convicted of certain crimes. And so there's been a significant amount of, I'd say, um, concerted advocacy, which in, includes legal aid organizations, the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, as well as the banking industry, to reduce some of those barriers, both through uh, revised regulation and then also um, in December, uh, the Congress enacted the Fair Hiring and Banking Act uh, as part of the National Defense Authorization Act. So um, again, this is, this is an area where there is, I think, support um, within the banking industry as well as uh, within the criminal defense bar, legal aid organizations, and I, I think reentry employers and, and others where we all sort of shared a, a similar vision and there has been significant um, positive change um, in, in that space. So to, to get to the crux of your question, I really think it's finding that, that common ground um, and finding the thread that really sort of ties perhaps to, to, the, to the specific business at issue, uh, the specific interests there. But, um, I, I really think that that's, that's the key, is finding the, the common interest. Um, because I, I hear you on the potential hesitation, but where, where there is common ground, I think progress can be made. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Bevan, um, we know the Innocent Project does an incredible job at engaging many different types of stakeholder partners, from media to private law firms, among others, across the work that you do. Could you tell us about those partnerships and particularly why you think some of these groups care about these issues and what engages them to get involved? We do do an incredible job when it comes to these particular organizations, but I think that's also attributed to the generosity of the partners that we work with. And you know, to the point that my colleague made, it's about striking that right balance. And a lot of the stories, a lot of the clients that come through the doors of the Innocence Project, it's a human story. 
the impact of wrongful convictions, as we have seen so often, it could be anyone. It could happen to anybody. And so that in and of itself is immensely appealing, both from you know a media perspective in terms of partner uh, partnering in, in that respect. And of course, our clients have very complicated relationships with the media in the sense that oftentimes when they're being tried, that has been a source of much contention in terms of the way that they've been framed. And so here is an opportunity for us to be able to retell their story from their perspective. When it comes to our law firm partners, it's been a work in progress. You know, we've had the benefit of 30 years uh, working on that. And now, oftentimes, they're our bigger, biggest supporters. You know, we have dozens upon dozens of law, firm, law firms and organizations willing to contribute pro, pro bono um, hours. And part of the appeal is we get the benefit of being able to work with these law firms that have the resources that, quite frankly, we don't. You know, they have the person power, they have the financial means, they have the technology that we just don't have access to. But at the same time, we grant them an opportunity to really do meaningful work on a, in a way that a lot of them don't necessarily get exposure to. And I'll give you an example. In our intake and case evaluation department, we have now almost 10 law firms that we work with. And two of these law firms have dedicated every single associate as a part of their first year initiative to work on at least one Innocence Project case. And that comes through being able to build relationships, being able to strike that right balance. And so it's not necessarily, you know, hesitation. I think it's about trying to, uh, in, you know, take the need that the Innocence Project has, that nonprofit organizations have, and trying to strike that right balance with what the law firms are also looking for. And in our instance, we've been very fortunate uh, with the law firm partnerships that we've been able to strike. Thank you very much. Just a quick follow-up with the media. How did... How did that relationship kind of evolve? So as you said, for our clients, oftentimes it's very complicated because they're on the TV in jumpsuits and in chains. Um, and so to, to be able to turn that around and really show the human side of, as, as you said, these are complicated individuals, complicated situations and cases, and make sure that people see them as, as just people. If you could talk a little bit about the, your relationship with the media. The relationship is complicated, and part of the reason is so often the cause of our client's wrongful conviction is often the byproduct of the perfect storm, you know? And so it might, it's never usually one leading cause of wrongful conviction. You rarely have an instance where it's just an instance of eyewitness misidentification or just an instance of inadequate defense or prosecutorial misconduct or, you know, in the form of non disclosure. Oftentimes, it's a variance of factors that have been presented via the media to the public. And so for our clients, there is immense hesitation in terms of engaging with the media at the point where it actually might be to their benefit. And so we're very thoughtful in our engagement with the media because we recognize that, we realize that. And so to that point, it depends on the case, uh, as it so often does. There are instances where the media can be of benefit, but there are also instances where it isn't necessarily of benefit. And so we try our best to do that. And in terms of the media's interest in us, again, it's the compelling nature of the stories that are told, right? They're the every story. You have individuals that have been wrongfully incarcerated uh, for decades, some more than 50 years at a time that have been separated from their families. And so that in and of itself is compelling. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I like to, uh, thanks for pointing that. I like, like to follow it up about the media. Uh, I, I too was, um, I served 27 years in the Michigan Department of Correction on a wrongful conviction. In 1985, I went to prison. In 2012, the federal courts overturned my conviction after 27 years, and I was subsequently released. At the time of my, of my trial and conviction, I was on the front page of the newspaper every week. I was in, on the media and the news, everything. And But when my conviction was overturned, not a peep. Mm. Not a peep. The prosecutor didn't apologize. The media didn't say, oh, this man was wrongfully convicted. He spent 27 years while he was in prison. None of that. The media sells salationists for copy. 
So when you hear these stories, hear them with a grain of salt because there's always two sides to every story. Mm -hmm. And you, only one side is only told, the prosecutors and the law enforcement side. So when you hear these stories of people that do these heinous things, say, I want to actually how true, what's the actual details behind the story? Because there's always more detail behind the story. So thanks for pointing that out about the media. Absolutely. And Ronald, I know in your current role, you have that complicated relationship with the media because you have to work with the media <laughs> and the public. And can you talk to us a little bit about that? Because that is setting aside your own personal story or maybe using that, yeah. using that story. I mean, I, I, use, I use my story. I don't, I don't run from it. I don't hide from it. I lead with it. So the media aspect for me is not that difficult. But as our organization, as we fight for the criminal justice reform around policy and law and what have you, you know, oftentimes the media, they, they are focused on, you know, our wrong, our convictions as if they were, you know, weren't wrong for there was no problem with them. They'll, they'll detract from the work that we're trying to do by using the stories of the people that we represent in the, in the directly impacted community. So it's difficult. I mean, we have, I do, I work with the media a lot. I get invited to conferences to do com a conversations around how to engage the media, person first language, and what have you. So it's, it's, it's like a kabuki dance. It's real difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, Nira, what would you tell someone who wanted to engage with the business around a particular reform effort, how to go about that, how to start that conversation? Well, you know, I think I spoke to it a little bit earlier, and I think it's a question of finding the com common ground. Um, in terms of, um, you know, sort of what that entry point might look like, I, I, I think, you know, members of the of corporate communities that are engaged in these conversations through NLADA or otherwise are, are probably good starting points. Um, and I do think it, it's a question of sort of alignment of values um, and, and really having those conversations. Again, I think, you know, when I, I highlighted the example before around increasing um, access um, to, to jobs in the banking industry for impacted individuals. I, I think that's a very specific example of, of where interests can, can be aligned. Um, and I, so I think it's, it's a question of the corporate community being engaged in public spaces and vice versa and, and finding those connections and those alignments. Um, they may not necessarily uh, present themselves on the surface, but I think, again, as, as there are more conversations and relationships are built, um, there's an opportunity there to really explore um, good public-private partnerships and advancement of public policy. Wonderful. Thank you. Bevan, what advice do you have for public defenders or other stakeholders who care about the right to counsel about working effectively with individuals that are directly impacted? That's a great question. And I think the first point I would make, I would raise up the point made by the, our previous panelist, uh, Regina Kelly, who said that if directly impact the community, we don't care about what you know till we know about how much you care. So as a, as a, def, as a uh, public defender or anybody engaged in that community, let them know, get, show them you know, your humanity first. Engage them on a humanistic level first. And then engage them, show them what you know about how to represent them in a court of law. And you get a much better uh, reaction outcome from them. Secondly, I would point out that <laughs> directly impacted people, they may not know the law or the procedures as well as you do, but they know the intimate details of, the law, of, the, of their cases, including their names. <laughs> that would be a benefit in helping you defend them. Um, so have an ear to hear and decipher through the sometimes in artful layman's terms in which they may speak as you try to engage them. And also, like Regina said, be honest about the ramifications and collateral consequences they're facing. Oftentimes, I know you know we, we over, you overburden in the work that you're doing and representing them, and oftentimes you know they get you know plea, they want a plea deal because they want to get out of jail at all costs. And I can speak to that, you know, knowing from per firsthand information, but. If they know the collateral consequences of taking a plea deal, especially as a felony plea, they have 45,000 collateral consequences that come with that felony plea, felony conviction, that they don't think about at the time they're taking. They just want to get out. And even if you serve in the long term, you lose your right to a direct right to appeal. You can't even appeal a, a plea bargain unless by leave of court. 
And then after you do get out, you have all these collateral consequences. Some states you can't vote. Some states you can't live near certain, you can't live near a school, or you can't have access to a computer. You can't work certain jobs. You can't live in public housing. You don't have access to trans, you can't get a license. You don't have access to public p transportation. So be honest about the collateral consequences that they're facing when you engage them. Say, hey, this, this plea deal may look good on the surface, and you may get out in a few weeks, a few months, or a few years, but it's going to follow you for the rest of your life, like a scarlet letter. So lastly, I would say learn and practice holistic defense, which is the foundation on which Gideon versus Rain White was built. Thank you very much. And Bob, would you like to just add any more words to that about what you would advice you would give to public defenders or stakeholders? I think Ronald covered it beautifully. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I want to sincerely thank our, our panel for being here today. As we've talked about, this work is so critically important. We've talked about the crushing caseloads that public defenders have, the crushing workloads. We've talked about the need for our strategic stakeholders and our partnerships. And like our last uh, speaker, it also really comes down to that individual client that's so very, very important. I will end with my story of my client who happened to call me um, when I was walking over here from the Stanley Correctional Institution in Wisconsin. Once again, back to Wisconsin. Uh, he wanted to wish me good luck. I hadn't even remembered that I had said anything about coming to DC. I think he really wanted to make sure that I landed safely because he's terrified of flying. Um, but we're not even working on his criminal case anymore. And it really is talking about what Ronald has talked about and what Re Regina's talked about. It's so much more than that criminal case. He's working on his reentry and all the obstacles that are put in place every single day, whether it's employment, housing, school, reconnecting with your children, um, reconnecting with your community, uh, reentry services. It's so very important. And to be able to walk with that individual and help them out is so, so important. And oftentimes what we hear is, you have to move on, you can't care too much, or you have to, or you care too much, you have to move on. And I think as public defenders, we know we can never care enough. And we have to make sure that everybody in our communities know that we can never care enough. These are real people, individual people, they're our neighbors, they're our children, they're our mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers, and we need to be there as much as we can for them. So again, thank you for all of you for being here today, and thank you to this panel, wonderful. We really appreciate it. So I'm not going to bury the lead. We do have a reception for you um, right down the hall. And that's the wonderful smell you might be might be engaging in right now. But I do want to take the, uh, the last opportunity we have today to, again, thank our sponsors, Arnold Ventures, Vital Projects at Proteus and MacArthur Foundation. Um, also to thank leadership from our partner organizations, the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, National Association for Public Defense. Um, you know, we, we, do, we do work nationally to really move these issues forward. We held you here for quite a number of hours, and it's not even nearly enough. Um, the attention that we need to draw to these issues. A thank you to the Justice Department, Attorney General Garland and Director Rossi, and to all of our speakers um, for being here today, and to all of you for the work you do every day. Please know it doesn't go unnoticed that we are working for you. Um, and our reception is ready. So. <laughs>